No, that's, those are, are no slides. Anyway, okay. So we have a second award, and the second award is the European Society of Human Genetic Award. And this award was formerly uh, named the Mauro Baschirotto Award. It was founded in 1992 and is presented by the Society during its annual European Human Genetics Conference in recognition of an individual achievement in human genetics, an individual from Europe. And this year, our D will be Arno Palotti. Arno was born in Helsinki. He was trained at the University of Ulu. Both, he has both an MD and a PhD. He is currently the research director of the Human Genomics Program at the Institute of Molecular Medicine in Finland, FIM, in Helsinki, but also a faculty at the Center for Human Genome Research at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, which is an associate member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And Arno is working on, and he will, I'm sure, not fail to present this, is trying to understand the genetic mechanism underlying common disease. And main focus areas are the genetics, neurological, and neurodevelopmental, neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric trait. And to draw this, basically, he draws advantage to the particular stratification of the Finnish population, but also of a unique, both clinical and population-based sample of this founder of the Finnish population. And I, I want also to finish by saying that Arno is also directing uh, the SISU project, SISU for Sequencing Initiative of SWOMI, SWOMI being the other name of Finland. And SISU is a unique Finnish concept, which basically uh, could be translated or paraphrased uh, in this way. It means strengths of will, determination, perseverance, and acting rationally in the face of adversity. And I have to say that a bit the human genetics uh, community has been uh, facing this and has had some sisu through the last two years. And so maybe we have, each of us, some Finnish allele. But I'm sure Arno will say something about this. Congratulations, Arno. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for uh, the European Society of Human Genetics. I feel really honored and humble to be here. And thank you for you who stayed to the end of the meeting and, and uh, listening to some of the aspects of, of the Finnish population, and, and which I hope that uh, I can um, share with you today and how that can be uh, used and uh, being in benefit for the current um, uh, in the current era of, of human genetics. So, um, from, from CISU to power of, of genetic isolate, I don't know if these two things to, uh, go together, but, but CISU uh, is maybe um, also reflected by, by some of the history of our country, its location and, and, and uh, uh, many hundred years of, of being part of, of, of bigger nations. So. Um, but the population uh, comes uh, mainly from uh, southern, uh, from from central Europe, uh, but also from the eastern part. And then the question is that that since we have been uh, relatively isolated over the over the hundreds of years, uh, thousands of years actually, so is are there aspects that we could use um, in ad our advantage in in research of, of human genetics? And going a little bit back to the history of, of the Finnish population, so it was um, uh, established, uh, or, or the current population of Finland uh, comes from uh, from a small settlement of uh, of people some few thousand years ago, but uh, then being in the corner of Europe and in uh, also linguistically quite isolated, so uh, the population remained small for a quite long time, 
and then it was mostly inhabited in the, in the uh, uh, coastal regions, but then uh, being part of Sweden, so the Swedish king in the 16th century uh, demanded uh, a portion of Finns to move to the eastern and northern parts of, of the country to protect uh, uh, the uh, eastern border of, of, at that time, the Swedish nation. And what then happened uh, in the uh, 18th century f uh, forward was the same thing that happened in many other or most other Nordic countries is that the population expanded quite uh, rapidly. And this, not the, for a surprise for this audience, resulted in, in uh, the genetic bottleneck effect. And what it obviously means, uh, familiar to this audience, audience again, uh, certain genetic variants become enriched and more easy to discover. And those, uh, an example of that has been in the past, the, the mostly recessive diseases of, of so-called Finnish disease uh, heritage. But also, in the modern era, it helps to reconstruct the genome of quote-unquote Finns uh, by imputation uh, techniques and makes characterization of even low-frequency variants clearly a lot easier than in more mixed populations. But it's not only about the uh, population structure. There are a few other uh, cornerstones that stand on the opportunities and possibilities how we can use it in, in for f our benefit in research. Uh, one comes from the health registers, uh, something which is again typical for all Nordic countries, uh, which are o originally developed to, uh, to monitor the national healthcare uh, usage. That provides a lot of information and which has been uh, for decades used in epidemiological studies and these epidemiological studies and their consequences is really on the, uh, in the heart of, of uh, um, the heritage that, that we use in our benefit currently uh, for the current uh, studies. This also resulted in these uh, sample collections in what we call now biobanks, uh, but they originally were really for uh, epi purely epidemiological studies, but, uh, but later on then used also for, uh, for genetic research. And not only does it provide innovative study design, but also it stimulates us for special collection for to be then used for innovative study designs. I'm going through a couple of, uh, actually three of them. And first examples of disease-focused collections. So one of the most recent ones is a psychotic uh, uh, study, which we call Super Finland. We have Sisu Finland, we have Super Finland, all, all uh, pompous names. Um, and uh, this was um, initiation uh, by the um, Stanley Center at the Broad Institute to um, collect worldwide collections of um, the, uh, in, uh, cases with, uh, with psychosis to enhance uh, the sample uh, number to really dig into um, these difficult disorders and their, especially their hard genetics um, for, uh, for further studies. So in, um, during the years of, of uh, 2016 and 2018, we collected uh, 10,000 psychosis patients in, in the country. And this uh, highlights again the opportunities, some of the opportunities we have in Finland. It was not entirely difficult to, uh, to initiate a, an entire na nationwide collection of even this type of, of um, disease collection. Uh, all of the uh, samples were then uh, GWAST and uh, exon sequenced and um, also uh, collection for, for uh, samples uh, for cells so that for future IPS uh, cells would be possible. And uh, here are really um, uh, key individuals involved in, in, um, in this collection. What it ended up with is that, that we, had a, we have a collection of, of different psycho psychosis um, uh, diagnostic categories. More, more than half of them were schizophrenics, but also covering other forms of, of uh, um, uh, psychosis. This provides us an opportunity to look into uh, uh, 
shared and uh, distinct genetic con uh, contributions of these studies. If we start with common variants and looking at the PRSs, so as we know, um, in uh, these type of uh, psychiatric disorders, the uh, genetic, uh, common genetic susceptibility background is very much shared. It is there, there's a high correlation between. But if we look at uh, uh, individual uh, categories within this particular super study group and look at the polygenic score of schizophrenia uh, on one axis and, and the major depression on another axis. So we can see that indeed the schizophrenic group as a known entity, and somewhat interestingly, those ones with mood components also group as an own disorder. So it provides a little bit of a glimpse that, that there is uh, biological background differences also in these studies. These type of studies have been further also studies, of course, in the, uh, in the Psychiatric Genetic Consortium. But then going back to the ne uh, national health registers and how they could be used in, uh, to analyze this type of a um, uh, cohort. So, as I said, uh, these were originally developed for, for monitoring the healthcare usage, which means that in whichever hospital you, you stay uh, in the country, the diagnosis of that hospital uh, visit goes to uh, a central register. Same thing when you purchase a, uh, a prescription drug and or causes of death or cancer registers and so forth. And these registers go back all the way, the cancer registers all the way to the 1950s, but most of the hospital registers started in, in 1968 and, and forward have, have then been collecting data of every single visit of every single uh, resident so that you really can build a longitudinal um, perspective of healthcare usage for each individual. So when we dive into individual patients, and this has obviously been uh, a little bit shuffled, uh, thank you Olli for providing the slide here. Uh, so uh, this is one example of one schizophrenia patient fr going from uh, from age 13 all the way to the most recent um, recordings in, in, in uh, age of roughly 34. And, and there you can start to build this, um, these longitudinal views and maybe uh, even look at uh, options that how are these uh, uh, people doing over lifetime and is there a genetic correlation to this? And um, although the trajectories uh, have challenges in how to, how to look at them in, in this type of a setting, but if we, for instance, uh, ask the question that has schizophrenia PRS um, anything to do with the, uh, with the severity of the disease? And yes, it seems to be that those ones with the highest schizophrenia scores compared to those ones with the lower schizophrenia scores, there is a difference in, hosp uh, in the hospitalization burden over time, so that those ones with high scores seem to have more hospitalizations over uh, the lifetime. And further off, if you compare with the PRS of educational attainment, you can, identify, you can see that, that it seems to, a higher educational attainment PRS seems to be protecting these same schizophrenia individuals from hospitalization. Uh, so there are various ways that we can start to look uh, on the genetic contribution to disease trajectories when you have the longitudinal data. Then uh, this, is, this was related to common variants. If we look at uh, rare variants, which in the case of schizophrenia are really rare, uh, but the schema consortium led by Mark Daly and Ben Neal and uh, TJ Singh, who, who has done a huge uh, job in, in uh, reading the 24,000 uh, uh, schizophrenia exome data, has identified roughly, uh, depending on how you, whether you set the threshold, but with the FDR uh, approach, uh, roughly 30, 32 uh, genes which are contributing, rare genes which are contributing to uh, schizophrenia risk, and uh, you look, uh, no, I went 
to the back, wrong direction. And again, if you identify those who carry those uh, variants, uh, you have an opportunity again to look at the longitudinal trajectories. We are still in the middle of this to analyze them, but it seems to be that there is not a huge difference in, in uh, those who have, uh, have a uh, penetrant uh, variant contributing to the disease susceptibility, maybe potentially suggesting that these might be good models to understand some of the schizophrenia biology. And since these are coding variants, rare variants, they provide a much better avenue towards understanding the functional consequences of, of uh, 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 the genetic background um, in, in these type of diseases. But then the question is, what, what about other neurodevelopmental uh, diseases? Um, again, uh, thinking of the um, uh, population structure, the, uh, uh, both intellectual disability and schizophrenia are more prevalent in, in the uh, eastern and northern part of, of, of the country, again, probably reflecting some of the genetic uh, background here. So uh, we have collected together with Olli Pietiläinen, Olti Kuismin and uh, Lea uh, Urpa uh, a collection of, of uh, almost 1,700 uh, patients and 3,600 participants in, uh, in, from northern Finland which in, in, with intellectual disability and especially uh, uh, mild intellectual disability. And interesting, uh, 30, uh, uh, two uh, of them carry uh, the individuals carry a protein truncation variant uh, which was identified in schizophrenia patients in schema. And that provides an opportunity to start to look again into uh, functional consequences. And uh, as Steve Hyman always said, if we produce just a list of genes, it really, uh, we have failed what we are actually doing. We need to understand the consequences of, of, of them and building, uh, for, for instance, IPS type of models uh, to, to understand the functional background is one step towards this. And these 14 genes which are shared with both mild intellectual disability and schizophrenia are one of the, is one of the um, uh, focuses of, of these type of studies. So these were disease-specific collections, but what about when you move towards biobank studies, uh, which, is, which are uh, currently something which uh, is quite a lot used in the field. Uh, I'd like to highlight some of the pioneers in the field, the DECO Genetics, UK Biobank and, and uh, Estonian. Uh, genome center or, or uh, collection which really have been pioneering this type of approach and we have, have been now coming a little bit afterwards and, and some of the opportunity provided by, uh, uh, for, for us in Finland has been the change legislation which have, have been uh, moving towards enabling large-scale studies and especially the Biobank Act which is based on a broad consent that people consent towards uh, medical re research in a biobank and uh, they don't specify which particular project that is, is in, in question. And it also provides an opportunity for collaboration with industry that's stated in the law. So now we currently have some 11 biobanks around the uh, country, um, mostly located, the, most of them being located in university hospitals. And uh, FinGen is one of those uh, uh, biobank projects which is using uh, uh, the biobanks. It aims at collecting roughly 10% of the population, some 500,000 individuals, uh, using, again, the national register data as the, as the main uh, phenotype background, doing, uh, having a Finnish-specific array designed, um, uh, uh, an axiom array, and again using a Finnish-specific um, whole genome sequence imputation backbone currently of some 8,000 individuals so that we can really identify fr uh, uh, frequencies, uh, variant frequencies to a quite low um, uh, threshold. And this provides the study 
uh, set uh, for association analysis. It's a public-private research project where all the Finnish biobanks are involved, all university hospitals in Finland, all universities with a, uh, with a medical school, Institute of Health and Welfare, which works under the Ministry of Health, and, um, and the, and the uh, Blood Transfusion Center. The Finnish uh, part of the funding comes from Business Finland, and then we have 13 pharma partners who are uh, active uh, research partners in the project. We really work as a team together to plan what we are doing. It's not so that, uh, uh, that, that we would be separately working on our uh, aims here, but we really plan together how the project moves forward. It's a 10-year project uh, currently. Uh, it, in, it was initiated in 2017 with the idea that during the six first years we build up the structure so that we have, a, uh, have the 500,000 um, individuals collected and then uh, we are now uh, looking into the next uh, phase of four years uh, where we plan that that would be mainly focused on analyzing and understanding the functional consequences of, of some genetic variants. So, uh, again, the nationwide health register being the uh, focus here, how to, how to collect uh, the disease data, uh, disease uh, entity data, including the longitudinal follow-up. And where are we now with the sample collection? We actually, the biobanks have already collected over 500,000 participants uh, uh, altogether. Uh, there were some legacy cohorts built, as I was, de was de describing, some of the uh, epidemiological cohorts like thin risk, and then prospective collections of, from hospitals, uh, which uh, uh, clearly enhances for disease-specific uh, um, endpoints. We produce uh, uh, data freeze every six months. Uh, the current, the, uh, the latest data freeze is almost 400,000 uh, individuals and uh, have uh, over 4,000 disease endpoints based and built on the, on the National Health Register uh, data. But uh, there have, we have been building much more than, than, than the data collection. So we have provided and developed an infrastructure for research and specifically now tools to analyze the data. And living in, in the current European uh, regulatory environment, uh, no comments about that. Everyone knows about uh, the challenges and, and pluses and minuses there. But one of the things that we had to solve is that how can we build an environment where things cannot be downloaded from, but still all partners can access the data. So uh, at the time, uh, uh, the decision was that, that we build a Google Cloud environment where we have a uh, closed, secure area where individual level data can be under analyzed by all partners and all partners uh, scientists, but the data cannot be copied out from there. The green, uh, as we call the green area, is then, uh, are then results uh, uh, that are produced by in, from individual level data, and each of the, each of the uh, partners have their own sandbox area in this Google Cloud format. Again, as said, individual level data in what we call red uh, sandbox and, and results in, in what we call green sandbox. So in a way, we have solved a problem uh, that has been claimed to be unsolvable, that how do people access data from outside the EU area? In reality, what we have not been able to solve is that all of you could access the individual level data, just like in UK Biobank. That's, of course, something we would like to, but the regulatory environment uh, has made it uh, more difficult, and uh, what, what we do is the next best, best thing. It, we um, release all uh, data results every, uh, well, every six months uh, to the entire community, and already more than 2,200 uh, scientists around the world have downloaded it. And if, if you like to uh, work with individual level data, it's, uh, you need to do it through one of the partners, which we typically are very open, open uh, to do. It's typically more the bandwidth problem than, than any other uh, uh, 
reason. But 20 minutes are not. Great, thank you. That's what my uh, timer says as well. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and tools to, uh, then we also have uh, developed tools to browse the results. Uh, this is another area that, uh, uh, that people need, I mean, to easily use the data. You need to um, uh, browse the, um, you need to be, have easy tools that even an MD like me can browse and look at the data. And, uh, and, and that is what our uh, teams, uh, led by um, Mitya Kurki and, and Timo Sipila, have been uh, frenetically working it, and, and, and uh, I think we are quite pleased with, with many of the tools that, uh, that have been developed. So building the infrastructure, so what about harvesting? So as said, the current data freeze uh, almost 400,000, 390,000 Finns uh, with genome data, uh, with health data over, for over uh, 50 years. And, uh, and, and uh, the, the all Finnish scientists and 13 subs uh, subscribing pharma partners have access to, and, and the public data releases I was already talking about. But when we look at this, uh, this data from uh, in the FIBEB, so, uh, so there is, uh, quite a wealth of findings, obviously. And uh, probably more than four, actually more than 400 Finnish specific gene association. We take the uh, very common, uh, well-studied uh, diseases like type two diabetes, we still see uh, Finnish specific variants in uh, almost all of these uh, diseases. And that's where the power of the genetic isolate and the, uh, how do I say, characteristics of the, fin of the isolate comes from. And if we specifically look now on variants enriched in Finland, and uh, so there are new genes and new variants and obviously, hopefully, uh, new biological insight. And as Conrad uh, has already in the Gnomad uh, Nature paper described, so, so uh, uh, most of the Finnish variants are in the uh, in the normal co uh, uh, range as, as in other European populations, but there is this excess of, of, of uh, low frequency variants where the specific sweet spot uh, lies. And interestingly, when we look at coding variants, where we hope that, that there would be easier understanding of the biology behind the uh, disease, so uh, most of those uh, low frequency as, uh, associated coding variants are in the really low frequency um, uh, spectrum. Some uh, almost 12% of the significant genome-wide significant association have a coding variant in their credible set. Uh, some 538 unique coding variants uh, are uh, identified across uh, almost 500 genes. More of half of them have a uh, minor alle allele frequency of less than uh, 5% and they are typically enriched in fin fin uh, Finland, and this is obviously a signature of the natural selection. And I take a few uh, relatively random examples, that, like, like here's vestibular neuronitis, uh, uh, happens to have a Finnish enriched coding variant that increases the risk with uh, roughly uh, four times uh, uh, minor allele frequency of less, one, less than 1% in the tuba 1CG. This is a very typical site. There are over and over these examples. Or then otosclerosis, an, another disease which is somewhat underrepresented in, in, in uh, disease-specific studies. This is one opportunity that the biobank studies provide that we can look at, at uh, areas where uh, sample select, uh, collection hasn't been extremely active. And otosclerosis is, an, is a disease of, of uh, abnormal, abnormal bone growth in the middle uh, ear, resulting in, in, uh, uh, in conductive hearing loss so that the, uh, the middle ear bones don't work in the way that, that as they should. And uh, when looking at, uh, this was already in what we call release six, we identified 11 loci now, currently 22 loci in uh, 2,200 cases. Um, but what specifically I like to highlight is, is what uh, we call here the MEPA gene, uh, again a Finnish enriched variant, uh, which, uh, uh, and this is then a meta-analysis with uh, genome 
uh, with uh, the Estonian Genome Center and, and, and UK Biobank, uh, more loci. But the key finding uh, that uh, overall there is, it's, it's a connection between uh, uh, ossification and, and uh, bone remodeling, um, uh, which makes a lot of sense when you think of, of the basic disease mechanism of autosclerosis. And TGF beta signaling, which has also been very much uh, described in, in ossification. But uh, this uh, Finnish and rich risk uh, um, frame shift variant, which increases the risk in MEPE, is, is, is of, of some interest. So, again, a typical story. Uh, low frequency variant uh, here, uh, uh, some five times enriched in Finland, and increasing the risk of, 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 of the disease. Uh, in a murine model, uh, you can identify uh, MEPE both in the, under the um, embryonal uh, uh, development and in an adult in, in the otic capsule, so it makes sense that, that this particular protein is present in, in D there. And it has been previously linked uh, to bone tissue uh, turnover. And what we can see, again, an example of a biobank study, the pleiotropy, we can see that indeed uh, the variant increases the risk of osteosclerosis, but also the fracture of, of, uh, of the leg, leg, leg including here, uh, ankle. So, uh, moving over to the uh, opportunity look at, to look at pleiotropy in, in uh, biobank stu studies. There are more of these where you have same uh, variant and different uh, effects. One being the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where SPDL1, again a Finnish enriched variant, is clearly a risk fo focus for, uh, locus for idi idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. But it's on the same time protective for all cancers. And these type of protective var variants, hopefully, of course, not uh, in, in a situation where you increase the risk for another disease, are obviously of special interest when you try, try to look for, um, for targets, uh, for uh, ph pharmacological uh, targets, ther therapeutic targets. Um, Part of, of the Finnish genetic history goes to, to understanding uh, the background of, of uh, uh, Finnish disease heritage, mostly recessive disorder. So there, it was a natural uh, place to look at that. What about uh, looking at diseases that were considered recessive? Is that always quite so? Again, using the opportunities that the biobank study can provide. Henrik Heine, who I think is somewhere in the audience here, uh, was asking this question, focusing on the rare uh, and low frequency variants, uh, which are no typically considered uh, recessive, and, and looking at the longitudinal analysis from both ways, both uh, from a recessive perspective and, and an, uh, uh, when, when one variant, uh, one mutant variant is, is, is present. And what she, she found is that this is an example of five known recessive diseases uh, uh, where the GWAS hit was uh, sufficient, uh, where indeed uh, three of the five had effects also in heterozygote state. The Serpina 1 is, is, is a known example. The XPA1 uh, uh, is less. Uh, there is some data about it, but, but less described. And then the Finnish nephrotic syndrome. All of, all of those three have clearly effects also in a heterozygote state. This being here an example, just one of the example, uh, the seroderma pigmentosum risk, which in a heterozygote form increases the risk for skin cancer, although typically uh, being thought as a recessive seroderma pigmentosum gene. So, other opportunities. One is obviously to look at, at disease susceptibility, but the other is that what about disease progression? There are uh, diseases like many cardiovascular diseases where probably same genes contribute to disease progression, but so many other diseases where probably the disease progression has a different genetic background than actually the th disease susceptibility. 
And here is just one example. This is not tricky to look at uh, to, uh, in a biobank study because people ent enter at different stages. There are differ different type of, of, of uh, follow-up data, uh, or follow-up length, and, and so forth, and, and the treatments have been changed. But, but it's not impossible to look at. And this is one of the early examples by Wei Chu, uh, who, who looked at disease progression related to arthrosis and asking the question that, is there an, a specific genetic risk uh, for those ones who progress to, towards hip re replacement? And indeed, those can be found. And this is one of the areas we like to di now dig in further in, maybe not with a GWAS approach, but asking that specific variants, how do they contribute to disease progression? So we think that we have developed a centralized research, uh, uh, research research that can be used by all Finnish researchers and uh, uh, the results all over uh, the world, and uh, maybe also stimulating the clinical community uh, to think of applications for uh, uh, clinical um, risk assessment, which, for instance, has been done now uh, in more uh, in depth by Samuli uh, Ripatti and, and Nina Mars in the case of, of, of cancers. But if we now compare to other uh, these large-scale uh, biobank studies, so what's different in Finjan? First of all, one thing is that it's nationwide, just like, like Estonia also. Uh, it's a special population. Uh, there is enrichment of disease cases due to the hospital uh, recruitment process, uh, very similar to, for instance, Japan Biobank. And uh, there is a public-private uh, partnership which, as, as the uh, industry uh, re uh, representatives say, it has an academic atmosphere. And uh, really that these 13 pharma and the academia are really working together and we think that that provides an, one of the models how, how things can be moved in the field forward. And all, also all the national partners are working together. And those who have worked to, with national um, uh, programs know that this is not always an easy thing to do, that everyone decides uh, to work together towards the same goal. And, and that the last but not least, the strong core analysis group and de uh, developing these uh, tools to look at browse the data and analyze the data, uh, that is uh, something which is different, for instance, from UK Biobank. So how are we looking forward for the, for the next four years? We like to understand better how uh, the Finnish and rich disease-associated rare coding variants uh, uh, work. What is their functional consequences? What are their, what is the pleiotropy uh, about them? And maybe learn towards therapeutic leveraging. And, and the other somewhat more challenging thing is to try to understand the uh, genetic background of pro uh, progression and the potential therapeutic responses that should and could lay the foundation what we call personalized medicine. Uh, and its uh, uh, genetic application. But however I'm proud of Finland and however I'm proud of, of the SISU and all these uh, things, it's just one collection uh, and one country. Uh, to move the field forward, we need uh, more work together, and a fantastic example is the Global Biobank Meta-Analysis Initiative led by Mark Daly and Ben Neal, where altogether 23 biobanks are working together over two million individuals currently, um, and thinking of various ways how to move from uh, variant to, to function. Those are the next challenges we have, and we all should work on those together. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any sense? 
Arno, Arno. So we are 